Not every NFL legend out there ends their career as a hero. Sometimes these guys gamble for a little too long and pay the price. Rice added his 13th Pro Bowl to his resume and overall helped the Raiders earn two playoff berths. While you may see baseball or even basketball stars play at high levels as they age, the sport of football does not exactly lend itself to a graceful aging process. The physical demands, intense pace, and pressure that the game is played with poses inherent challenges to even the NFL's most talented players as they get older. So much so that even some of the league's most legendary players, we are talking about bona fide Hall of Famers, finish their playing days in rather embarrassing fashion. So today, let's take a look at 10 guys in Canton who finished their their careers in, well, a rather embarrassing fashion. Starting off with one of the best quarterbacks that the NFL has ever seen, a guy who pretty much revolutionized the position and brought the passing game to the forefront across the league, former Miami Dolphins QB1, Dan Marino. The Finns' legendary signal caller held more than 40 NFL catches when he called it quits on a historic career at the conclusion of the 1999 season. But unfortunately for the Hall of Famer, his career's final act paled in comparison to the rest of Marino's 12-time All-Pro career. He posted just 11 games, posting a 5-6 record and throwing more interceptions than touchdowns, while his backup, Damon Heward, went 4-1 during his absence. Miami, of course, still had to start Marino once the playoffs rolled around, and in the divisional round against the Jacksonville Jaguars, ooh, it got ugly fast. Marino's Dolphins lost 62-7 in what was the largest losing margin in AFC playoff history, and his performance was a big reason why. He completed just 11 of his 25 pass attempts for under 100 yards, all while surrendering two interceptions in the process. So, not only was Marino's last season a tinge embarrassing, he went out following what was literally an all-time L. Man, could not happen to a nicer guy. Marino, however, isn't the only quarterback in Canton that got humiliated trying to play out the latter years of his career. How about Dallas Cowboys QB Troy Aikman? During his prime, Aikman headed up a fearsome Cowboys dynasty that won three Super Bowls in four seasons. He was a force to be reckoned with. The man was named to six straight Pro Bowls, but when it started to go for Aikman, boy, it went fast. During his last season in the league in 2000, Aikman put up the worst season of his career. He played just 11 games, going 4-7 while throwing two interceptions for every touchdown. And to make matters worse, there were crazy stories flying all around the Dallas Cowboys, not to mention that this was the season that T.O. completed his infamous kneel on the Cowboys star. Talk about a brutal end to an otherwise spectacular career. Or how about Broadway Joe Namath? Namath played the bulk of his career in the 1960s and was one of the NFL prospects to come out of college with a tremendous amount of hype around him. He played under the legendary Bear Bryant at the University of Alabama and led the Crimson Tide to a national championship during his senior season. Bryant spoke highly about Joe as well, calling him the greatest athlete he had ever coached. The New York Jets took him first overall in the AFL draft, but they had to compete with the NFL's St. Louis Cardinals for Joe's services, as the NFL and AFL were still separate at the time. New York ended up winning out, signing him to a $427,000 contract that was unheard of at the time, and thus the myth of Broadway Joe was born. His notoriety skyrocketed after he guaranteed a victory and, more importantly, delivered one against a heavily favored Colts team in Super Bowl III. Joe, however, was known for living fast and hard, and as you might expect, that definitely impacted his longevity. During his last three seasons, two of which he played for the Jets, with his last being out in LA, his performance fell off a cliff. In 29 starts over those three years, his completion rate never climbed above 50%, and he threw 49 interceptions to just 22 touchdowns. That last season in LA was really just a last-ditch effort by Namath to save his career. Things had already turned sour for him in New York. Though there was some optimism after a 2-1 start, Namath got pummeled by the Chicago Bears, giving the ball away four times and a one-point loss. This outing proved to be his final NFL breath, as he was benched for the rest of the season and retired at its conclusion. This is not too dissimilar to what played out for the Colts Hall of Fame QB, who Namath squared off with in Super Bowl III, Johnny Unitas. Unitas entered the league way back in 1955. He spent a season on the Steelers practice squad before finding an opportunity with the Baltimore Colts, where where he'd become the full-time starter in 1957. Unitas led the league in passing yards and touchdowns.
touchdowns with 2,550 and 24 respectively in his first season. And he went on to earn league MVP honors. This marked the beginning of one of the most highly decorated careers we've ever seen. United just won two more MVPs, was named to 10 Pro Bowls and 8 All-Pros, and led the league in passing yards and touchdowns four times. The end of his career, however, lacked much more of the glory he grew accustomed to early on. After winning the Super Bowl in 1970 at the age of 36, the bumps and bruises over the years proved to have made their mark on Unitas, and his play drastically declined. In 1971, he split time with backup Earl Morrell. Then, in 72, after losing four of their first five games, the Colts benched Unitas. They traded him to the San Diego Chargers at the end of the year, where it didn't get much better for the future Hall of Famer. His tenure in Cali started with a 38-0 loss, and yeah, things didn't improve from there. He went 1-3 as a starter in San Diego before getting benched, and he subsequently retired ahead of the following season. A most unceremonious end to a career for the man who was the first quarterback to throw for over 40,000 yards, despite playing long before the passing-friendly rules that we've seen added over the years. Okay, before we close the book on Hall of Fame quarterbacks that went out in utter embarrassment, I think it's only right that we mention one former signal caller who has only further tarnished his legacy since retirement. None other than Green Bay Packers legend, Brett Favre. During his playing days, Favre was known for being one of the game's most exciting passers, a true gunslinger whose arm strength was only rivaled by his toughness, as evidenced by his 321 consecutive games started streak, which was most in the league history at the time. He was also the first NFL quarterback back to hit 70,000 yards, 500 touchdowns, 200 wins, and achieve a victory over all 32 teams. Needless to say, the man could play. But at the end of his career, it wasn't always pretty. For starters, he had the whole retiring, unretiring thing that started in 2006 and lurked around far for the remainder of his playing days. After the Packers finally had enough and moved on from Favre to Aaron Rodgers, he spent one year with the New York Jets where he played well to start but fell apart due to injuries. He then broke Green Bay's collective heart by signing with the rival Minnesota Vikings, putting a slight stain on his relationship with the city that he called home and the fans that supported him for all those years. And when you tack on all the off-the-field issues that started to pop up, like the inappropriate way he treated Jen Sturger, and now his involvement in a Mississippi welfare fund scandal, it's safe to say that Favre has gone out in truly embarrassing fashion. Okay, we're done banging on the quarterbacks now. After all, they aren't the only guys that have finished off their playing days in, let's say, a not-so-glorious fashion. We've also seen a couple of legendary wide receivers do the same. In fact, three guys, who many would consider among the best to ever play the position, suffered a very similar fate at the end of their playing days. Let's start with Michael Irvin, the playmaker who tortured opposing defensive backs while playing with the Dallas Cowboys. Irvin was a three-time Super Bowl champ, a five-time Pro Bowler, and a three-time All-Pro, who had quite a reputation for playing just as hard off the field as he did on it. Though Irvin's play didn't deteriorate, his mental stability appeared to, as evidenced by his increasingly erratic behavior on and off the field, like the infamous training camp incident in 1998, during which he stabbed one of his teammates, Everett McIver, with a pair of scissors for taking his seat in the team barbershop. Uh, yeah, okay. Luckily for Irvin, the incident took place in Dallas in the 90s, so all that came from it was a six-figure settlement with MacGyver. That, of course, was brokered by Jerry Jones in exchange for Everett's silence. His career ended early the following season when he suffered a nasty back injury against the Philadelphia Eagles. Surely not the final act that someone with an ego like Michael Irvin would have wanted for themselves. It wasn't much better for the two guys who most seemed to pit against each other in the greatest wide receiver of all time debate, Jerry Rice and Randy Moss. During their respective primes, Rice and Moss were undoubtedly two of the best to ever do it. Despite having an unsuspecting appearance, Rice set just about every receiving record imaginable, all while accumulating 13 Pro Bowl selections, 10 All-Pros, 3 Super Bowl rings, and a Super Bowl MVP to boot. Moss, on the other hand, was as physically freakish as it got, standing 6 foot 4 with more than enough hops and speed to spare. He brutalized opposing defenses with an astounding ease, notching double-digit touchdown totals and 1,300-plus yards in five of his first six seasons in the league. Both guys, however, were much like March, which is to say they entered the NFL like a lion and left it as a lamb. After a brief renaissance with the Patriots from 2007 to midway through the 2010 season, Moss had a rather forgettable return to Minnesota. 
then two equally forgettable stops in Tennessee and San Francisco. As for Rice, after enjoying a lengthy and impressive prime in San Fran, he went down to Oakland where he had two good seasons, but soon his age started to show. After posting a 1,211 yard season in 2002, his production began to fall off each subsequent season, including his last in 2004 when he split time between Oakland and Seattle. Yes, just in case you forgot, Jerry Rice actually played real NFL games for the Seahawks. Don't worry if you block that out of your memory, I bet he has too. The Raiders, for whatever reason, just seem to be where Hall of Famers careers just go to die. Not only did both Rice and Moss have some pretty meh years with them, but so did one Warren Sapp. During his heyday, Sapp was one of the best defensive tackles that the league had ever seen. He possessed a rare athleticism for his immense size, which he used to befuddle offensive linemen and brutalize quarterbacks during his prime down in Tampa Bay. But after he left the Bucks, his output tanked. He split time between defensive tackle and defensive end, and none of the Raiders teams he played on were particularly good. This went from bad to worse for Sapp in 2007. He lost 49 pounds before the season, perhaps not hitting the weights with the same ferocity he once did, and he posted his lowest sack total of his career, netting just two despite playing all 16 games. His team finished 4-12 and, and he retired at the end of the season, but not before an embarrassing skirmish with referee Jerome Berger in week 15 that turned physical and ultimately cost him 75 grand in fines. Yeah, that's an ugly finish to an otherwise epic career. Last but not least, we have former Rams, Colts, and uh, Falcons running back Eric Dickerson. When Dickerson entered the league in 1983, he took the league by storm, rushing for 1,808 yards and 18 touchdowns, only to somehow raise the bar the following season by going over 2,000 yards, setting an NFL record in rushing yards with 2,105, which he paired with 14 touchdowns. For Dickerson, like many running backs, it went downhill fast for him. After recording at least 1,200 rushing yards in each of his first seven seasons, injuries started to nag him and his performance started to falter. The last four years of his career, he never amassed more than 730 yards in a season, and by the end of it, when he was with the aforementioned Falcons, he was undeniably a shell of his former self. Though the check still cashed, his legacy would have been all the more epic had he possessed the foresight to get out before his ugly decline. But it is quite rare that these guys do such a thing, because they just have so much pride and trust in their ability. But which NFL Hall of Famer do you think went out in the most embarrassing fashion? Was there anyone that we missed? Join us in the comment section below. If you liked this video and learned a thing or two, clicking the like button helps out a ton. And hey, we appreciate it. If this is your first time coming around to TPS though, subscribing is a great idea because we put out videos like this every single day. But as always, thanks for watching and we'll see you guys next time.